Hey guys, we'll get started in just one minute, but I wanted to give you some good news. We've got our Worship and Creative Conference coming up in October, the 23rd to the 25th, and you can join us online. So as a thank you to you, our podcast listeners, for being with us on the journey, we wanted to give you a discount, 20% off the whole online conference. Go to hillsong.com forward slash WCC and use the promo code podcast19. And now let's roll the intro. Hillsong Creative Podcast, where we hear from creative experts, influencers, dreamers, and doers, what they've learned and what we can learn from their journey as we explore, respond, and create. Hey, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. This is Rich Langton. I'm your host. I love doing this and I love that you're on the journey with us. Hey, last week we had a great episode with Pastor Brian, our senior pastor here at Hillsong Church. He uh, came to team night on a Thursday night and he spoke to us about, uh, I guess, his vision for our team and where he sees we should be at. If you haven't heard that episode, I'd really encourage you to go check it out because it's a good one. It really frames who we are as a creative team. And I think it can really help you in your creative creativity, no matter where you find yourself. But today, let me ask you a question. In the last 24 to 48 hours, have you watched a video in some way, shape or form? I'm guessing, but I reckon you've probably seen a Netflix video, a YouTube video, something on TV or online. Video is everywhere. It's pervasive and it's the way that the modern world is communicating. And on the podcast, we talk a lot about how we want to use our creativity to share the gospel. And so video makes sense as one of those ways we can do that. In our creative team, we have many great storytellers who use the medium of video to share the gospel in creative ways. And so in today's interview, I'm speaking to Ben Field, who heads up our film and TV department. He's a great storyteller and a man of God, and I'll introduce him more to you in the interview But I just wanted to say, you might not be a a video person or an editor or a storyteller in that way, but I think the things that we talk about are really applicable to the mindset that we all need to have as creatives. So let's jump straight into it. Welcome, Ben. Hey, Rich. Thanks for having me. So for listeners out there, Ben is the head of our film and TV. Is that how you would describe? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, anything that we do as a church that relates to film, content producing, screens, you know, anything like that, media. Yeah. Your your role has become pretty vast, which we'll get into in yeah. a bit. But you started, I guess my memory of how you started in the film and TV industry mm. is um, the series Home and Away. Yeah. Because you, you worked on that. Um, I did. Again, for people listening who are not from Australia, they might not know the show. <laughs> right. Um, so as a kid growing up, I was not allowed to watch like – drama or you know really? sitcoms or anything like that because of the influence i guess so mum and dad just didn't think it, probably yeah it wasn't yeah. going to be a great influence so there's there's a couple competing tv shows right daily kind of shows one of them was home and away right and for whatever reason my mum and dad let us watch that show so and now I know that you're one of the directors on the show and I think that's kind of funny because you were directly influencing me <laughs> as a kid. So tell us, how did you get into TV? You know, it's funny. I originally wanted to be a police officer growing up right. and during my schooling, that's kind of where things were heading. I had a few real talks with family friends that were police officers and they they gave me a very clear picture of what a police officer's duty was and mm. I think I was too soft-hearted to have to deal with that. And I kind of got turned off by that. I saw one time when we were living in Melbourne, I saw a commercial being shot on the side of the road in the city at night. And as we're driving past, I vividly remember it. I was probably 15 years of age, the lights and the people. And I think they, I think it was a car commercial or something. Yeah. And I just remember being kind of in awe of it, thinking, wow, look at that. Like, that's, that's really cool. And something in me was just like, I want to be a part of whatever that is. And I think it was probably more looking at the excitement and the buzz of, you know, what was being filmed. Mm. But over time, I just started falling more in love with storytelling and I guess the power and influence of 
um, being able to help shape culture through story and so on and so forth. Um, and then my my tendency, my personality is I kind of get kind of one-eyed about it. It's like, well, that's what I'm going to do. Hmm. So everything gets lined up and I'm shooting straight for that. Um, so I went through school. I left school early. Um, I didn't didn't graduate. My career's advice. I was I was the kid that used to muck up in class <laughs> to the point where some classes I wouldn't even be allowed in the class. I was told to sit out. Oh, wow. In hindsight, I think it's pretty terrible, but at the time I thought it was funny. <laughs> but um, my career's advisor said, you know, if you want to go into television and filmmaking, it's it's an industry that's based on who you know, not what you know. And like the saloon doors, like hmm. straight away I was out of school, went right. home, told my mum I'm out. Right. And she said, well, if you're going to do that, you need to go get a job. And so I applied and I actually got my first job working at Channel 10 as a stagehand. But throughout that process, I would look at what other people did and I was gravitated towards different types of roles and mm. directing was always something I wanted to do. I wanted to, to make movies. And um, I would watch directors and over the course of 10 years, I would work my way up slowly through the ranks when mm. people would get pregnant and leave and I'd be like, right. hey, could I get trained up and do that job? Mm. And it was in a period of time in the industry where people wanted to give young people a shot. It's, it's probably... Um, not like that these days because of, you know, all sorts of things. But I worked my way up and then I was blessed by, you know, having the fortunate position of directing Home and Away um, by the age of 29. Mm. And at the time it was I was given a chance because a, a new show called All Saints, which was a hospital show that came into Channel 7, had um, bigger budgets and it took a lot of the, the experienced directors away from Home and Away. And the producer knew that I was making short films. I had stuff on YouTube um, and I just loved playing around. Mm. And he said, look, I've watched some of the stuff you've made. You have a, a basic understanding of story structure and coverage. How would you feel about doing three-month intensive training with one of our directors okay. and then wow. directing Home and Away? Mm. For that time, directors, they're in their 50s and 60s right. and I was 29. Mm. And that was a huge open door. So, of course, I said yes and jumped in. And that's really what kind of governed the next couple of years of my life was directing television. But yeah. it was a it was a good 17-year journey to get to that. Right. Yeah. yeah, right. So then how does that parallel with your faith journey? Where did you where did you really discover, you know, God's call on your life? Yeah. Well, I, I used to always, you know, I guess when I was still living at home, I can remember watching in my bedroom films like Courageous and Fireproof, which in those times were Christian films, right? right. Mm -hmm. And as great as they are and, and without passing judgment, I was I would look at them and there'd be, I'd feel this kind of like um, righteous dissatisfaction with like, surely we can do better. Mm. And that's all it really was. Mm. And for their time, they were fantastic. And for faith film and funding and distribution, there wasn't an industry for it back then. And so they really were pioneering. But there was something deep within that I was mm. just like, surely there can be a different way to be able to do it. Not to replace what was being done, but mm people, there would be another people group that wouldn't identify with the way they would in been done. So that the faith and storytelling was always a part of the fabric. Mm. Little did I know that I think the secular journey, the mainstream journey was teaching me the skill set that would eventually arrive me back in church. I've been right. a part of Hillsong since I was 14, mm -hmm. served on the TV team, was a part of conferences and everything like that. And that's where actually I learned a lot of the skills that got me my first jobs was volunteering, right. learning how to plug in cameras. So I, I kind of that journey that with faith and storytelling, I guess it's an appetite to be able to create a new norm, um, pioneer a new norm for film and television. Mm. How that was going to happen, I had no idea really apart from I wanted to see people's lives transformed through faith. And I wasn't a pastor. I, you know, yeah. I mean, there's elements that I like about pastoring, but I'm not a speaker. I'm mm -hmm. not somebody that likes to get up and preach. But what I had was <laughs> a camera and mm -hmm. access to editing software. And so using that to tell messages of the gospel was mm -hmm. what I had. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So then, um, I guess going back to the working in the industry, looking back now, are there lessons, I guess, that you learned? I guess now as a more as a Christian and as a more mm. mature person, are there lessons from that time that you would want to pass on to perhaps younger people or people listening who are in industry? Yeah. In the industry, you have a lot of structure. You know, your skill is what's at the head of your game. You know, you have to be really good at what you do, mm. which I think is in any place that you work. 
for me, I, I haven't, didn't really put much time into thinking because the way that I look at my life is kind of God's seasons mm -hmm. and it's, it's interesting. I, being in the industry gave a lot of opportunity, but it also, unfortunately in me, it, it built what I, you know, later on would probably see as being unhealthy was as you as you climb that ladder and you get more notoriety for that ladder, it becomes a part of who you are. Mm. And becoming a, you know, in quotations, a director of, of television, yeah. you, you hold that as your mantle. Mm. And then what you very quickly learn when you become a part of church staff is that we don't, you know, lead by that and it's it's not biblical to mm. be identified by that. So I, I guess within the industry, as great as it is, and everyone's on a different journey, some people are called to be the light in there. Mm. But the lessons that I learned from that were not everyone thinks the way that you think, you know, not everybody um, understands your purpose and your mission mm. and nor do they care. Mm. Um, and that that's interesting. You know, I, I worked in environments where you would have people who battled with strong addictions and they would be in the workplace and you'd be facing those things, um, people of other religions and faiths. Mm. Um, unfortunately, people just keep to themselves on those things because no one wants that agenda pushed on them. Right. But I, I think for my my late teens and most of my most of my twenties being in that environment taught me a lot about humanity mm -hmm. and the world that we live in, which, you know, every now and again you have to kind of get back there working in well, you don't want working in ministry to be a bubble, but it, right. it can become that when mm -hmm. you've forgotten to rub shoulders with community mm -hmm. and get in the mess of humanity, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And experience those and we can just find our click and find our routine and then suddenly you're shut off from the rest of the world that you're trying to reach. Mm. The industry from a technical point of view, yeah, you get a lot of great opportunities and mm. it's always a time to put the head down and learn as much as you can. Yeah, And that for me was always what I loved about my transition was being able to bring that skill set into the church right. because, you know, we the systems and the processes that you learn being in the mainstream mm. can benefit the church. Yeah. Um, so I love that aspect of being able to bring mm. that in. When you were directing, were you also still serving, volunteering at church? I, I took a break during that time. The demands directing was, I mean, there were 75-hour weeks and then script reading on weekends. And that was a difficult time for me personally because I, the challenge was opportunity and at the time what you believe God's open doors and, you mm. know, you're creating some success. Um, and then the church stuff, you know, and all I could really manage at that point was just turning up if I was lucky because right. you're so exhausted. Yeah. yeah, I wasn't definitely not serving at that point in time, but mm. the hunger for, and we weren't really positioned, the, our church wasn't geared where you could come in and you could see a thriving TV ministry or there was opportunity. We didn't have a channel then. We weren't right. thinking the way that we did about media back then. Mm. So um, you didn't feel like you were missing out by not, you know, being a part of that side. Right. In the industry, you mentioned that it's very much about your your skill mm. and I guess who you know. Um, it's about who you know, but also about the technical yeah. ability. I imagine then it's a lot about um, comparison and it's, a, it's a, quite a competitive right. industry. Yeah. And therefore... Because it's like that, um, in, you, you'd be looking at other people's work all the time. You'd be comparing mm -hmm. people, your work against theirs, yeah. your like your output against theirs, yep. um, which could then lead to insecurity and For sort sure. of even comparison and, and competition. For sure. Is that – how did you respond to that kind of side of – Yeah, I mean, it's very real and um, <clears throat> me being as young as I was coming in with a lot of older directors – I don't know why I would feel like there was a sense of threatening there. Mm. I had nothing of what they had. Right. They had 30 years experience on, they were way down the line, down mm. the road on being way better. I would be in awe. But some were threatened because, you know, the young kid on the block. And so there was sabotage in conversations and right. things like that. How you deal with that? I don't know. I was too young, I think, to know how to deal with that. Mm. So you, you end up just being disappointed and feeling let down, I guess. Yeah. If it happened to me now, you know, now that I'm 38, I probably would approach it very differently. But I think I was probably naive to most of what was going on, you mm. know, in that. But but it is, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world and, and if you don't perform well on that week or those block of episodes that you're directing, 
the phone or the email doesn't come through with the next lot of scripts. Right. And there's not usually a conversation, a sit down to say, hey, you know, right. we're just we're hoping that you could direct better. Mm. It's just, thanks, we don't need yeah. you. We'll call you. Don't, right. Don't we'll let us. you know if anything else comes up. Mm. And so you don't have a chance to talk that out. You mm. just have to be the best. And so that does lend room for people kind of working the politics in the industry to, to get yeah. the jobs, you know. Mm. And so then I guess I'm thinking about people listening who might be in in the industry, right? how would you kind of pastor them in a way? Right. I know you said you're not a pastor, but how yeah. would you pastor them? How would you lead them in that? Yeah. To, what kind of work internally right. would you advise they do right. in order to not get hard-hearted but, right. but to be able to remain soft, remain kind of salt yeah. and light, but then not be jaded by the industry? Yeah. Well, I think having a confidence in knowing God's got you, I, th- I think, I wish I had more of that confidence, you know, back then mm. that um, that it's it's his will for you to be there if that's the case and right. he can soften hearts and harden other hearts to be able to keep you where you're mm. at, protect you. Um, but, you know, if, but don't hold on to things so tightly. I would look at, I would feel like in my younger years I would be driving a lot of my own life. Mm-hmm. Um, and that just comes with maturity where you realise hang on, God's got it all. Like, mm. why am I like trying to hold so tightly onto it and forge my own career and I want to be this and I want to be that. It's mm. like, have that hunger and desire, but understand that God's got the path. Right. And the thing over time that I learn is that the landscape constantly mm. shifts when you think this is it and because it's everything you've ever dreamed of. Mm. And then God turns you 90 degrees to the left and says, this is where you're going. You go, hang on, we just spent 10 years heading to here. Mm. I've only just put my feet down. He goes, Exactly. Yeah. Mission accomplished. Now I need you to go and do this. Right. And so understanding that you may think the path is clear and all your ducks are in a row, mm. but God sometimes uses those seasons just to get you to a point to then turn you the other way and that's mm. okay. Mm. And so sometimes those disappointments that lead to doors closing isn't necessarily a byproduct of you failing or you not meeting the needs or having enough. Sometimes God just says, that's enough. I've shown you what you need to see. I've let you experience what I need you to experience. Mm. Um, And as a result of that, um, there's some stuff to deal with and there's stuff you've learned in, Mm. but now I'm ready for you to come through where I've got you. And that's okay, Uh that the change and the shift is okay. Mm. So that's what I would say to people that are in the industry. The landscape shifts a lot, you mm. know, and in this creative conversation, you know, a lot of people want the badge of honour of their, their work and their art being a representation of who they are. It's their calling card. Yeah. And I used to be like that, mm. you know, how great I can create, enhance how people see me and my value to them. Mm. And then you just have to go through a lot of challenging situations in life to realise that that's nothing. Mm. It doesn't have value. Mm. It's a smoke screen for you feeling the way that you want to feel valued and loved. I mean, you can get through that and chip all of that away and just bear with all vulnerability to people and say, hey, this is who I am. Mm. Um, yes, I'm not the most skilled in that, but do you still love me? Mm. And build your friendships and your network around that. You set up for life more yeah. than more than that creativity. Mm. Um, I used to be really good at a lot of stuff creatively, yeah. and then I started working with people that were much better. And when you start seeing yourself, <laughs> if your skills the thing that drives you, mm. you're slipping down the pole, and you're seeing people do much better stuff. Mm. You can either choose to become envious, jaded, and bitter, or you can celebrate them and then figure out. Well, then how do I? enhance what they're doing or how do I fill mm. the gap? What's not being done? How yeah. do we let all boats rise yes. by their skill and then mm. what can I do? Yeah. So, yeah, it's a journey of life really, mm. isn't it? Mm. I found with that sort of thing, even playing music and, and that side of things, when we first came to Hillsong Church, I, I played lots of music prior mm. to, to being here. Um, but the but seeing other people who are better at that, more right. skilled, who'd put more effort in, perhaps more gifted, um, that just... Um, kind of highlighted to me uh, not, I guess for myself it wasn't that, what did it do? It highlighted where I was, where my passion really was right. and what I actually felt called to do. Mm. Um, so I, th- I think there's an aspect of that even that where you go, you celebrate someone else and it gives you a, ch- a chance to assess um, whether that's actually right. the, the path to take. Mm-hmm. So someone's in the industry, they're being knocked back all the time. Well, is it what I'm called to do? Should I continue right. and get better? Right. Or 
is it that perhaps this is confronting me with yeah. the fact that I'm actually not that passionate about it or I'm not as gifted or haven't put as much work yeah. in and perhaps I don't I don't even want to. Right. Um, it, it sort of gives well, you the opportunity things, to well, choose. They get, they get tested, don't they? Yeah. And, it, and it's in those testings that we start refining and dialing in the, mm. the true nature of that and how that fits in with the rest of our life. Mm. But I think that the closed door things are funny one, especially in industries like ours because – especially because a lot of people feel like they're called to something, which means in film and television, you get this quite commonly, which is like, oh, God's told me I'm going to make films. So I'm going to go to Hollywood and they're going to recognise my gift and right. the studio doors will open and I'll have, you know, and they're believing for it. Yeah. And then the moment they get there with nothing to show and people are like, sorry, we don't know who you are. They're like, where's God? My yes. faith's being tested, right. you know. And so, yes, I think in the those moments the definition of what you're called to do. I wanted to direct movies. I thought that was my calling. Yes. And I had to I had to realise that that was an, one aspect of what maybe my life might entail, but my calling was just to be with him, mm. you know, yeah. and I had to let go of my desire to be famous, you know, director, mm. be, you know, have all the notoriety for that and mm. just realise that I'm already loved and accepted because he first loved me. And then level playing field, whatever's on top's the icing. Mm. And then it makes the icing part much more fun, right? Because right. there's room to, to kind of balance and move. Mm. But some people that get rejection sometimes walk away and some keep at it. And I've, I've found like rejection after rejection after rejection doesn't often mean that you're not meant to be doing it. Sometimes God is just showing that he needs you to deal with how you handle rejection. Yeah. And the next right. door that's going to open is into a sphere that is much larger where there's going to be heavier rejection. And if he knows that you can handle the small rejections now mm. and understand that it's not a reflection of who you are or your mm. value mm. or your worth, he's going to open up doors of promise that is going to come with heavier. Yeah, more blessing, sure, mm. more opportunity, sure, but heavier rejection. Mm. You know, you go to a new level, as they say. I love mm. that. New levels, new devils, you know, it's one of those <laughs> kind of you know, saying. But it is true. If you mm. can't handle the small rejections yeah. of what that does to you on the inside, mm. then can he trust you in an arena where there's going to be heavier, yeah. more public you know, rejections? Right. Yeah, right. Um, so getting back to the journey, I remember when you first came on staff mm. and came to head up the film and TV yeah. kind of uh, department within creative and um, – and we have had conversations about your dreams um, and aspirations <laughs> right. even then. Um, and I think even then you, you could see a path forward, but it was still sort of through a, a, a dark forest or right. something like yeah. that. But now um, obviously things have opened up and, it, and it's quite a different yeah. landscape. I'd love you to talk to us about, I guess, the journey from then to now. Sure. How do you... Well, how did you get to where you are? What do we, right. you know, because because we didn't have a channel, we didn't, we no. weren't doing films, we weren't doing TV specials, no. But now we are. Yeah, um, a testament to God's faithfulness, to be honest, like it truly is, because I would consider vision is high on my strengths. Right, it's the first one, and I've always felt like I've had vision for things, but a lot of stuff just you're so blinded by. When I started. I came on out of, there was a hiatus, um, the previous leader of the team, um, it was about eight months, I actually cast your wife and um, had started talking to me about what could the TV team look like. And I was, I was voluntarily consulting while I was working at Seven. And we built this structure of what it could look like. Mm. And then the next question was like, great, when do you start? And I was like, no, I'm sorry, <laughs> I've, I've got a job, I'm happy. Yeah. But then that's when God said, no, you need to come. And started with eight creatives um, and what our workload looked like was church news, testimony videos, one annual album mm. and then whatever kind of like conference type stuff that we would do. For years we just worked at being committed to what, you know, we were given the tasks mm. to do. But there was always vision for film mm. and television but there was no clear path for it. We're a church. Yeah. You know, in this industry churches don't go out and, do channels or things like that. But there was always that deep desire. I remember talking to Pastor Brian probably about two years in and a couple of faith-based films had come out 
And they'd, they'd made like $36 million in the box office of like a $500,000 investment. Right. And the story was, you know, a dentist in the church who believed in film, wanted to fund it, and the church made it and they made it. Mm. I was looking at it purely from a financial point of view because, mm. you know, what I love to see is the church have the provisions to be able to plant churches yeah. and, and meet the needs. And so I sat down with him and I, I pitched it to him and he gave me four hours of his time which for Pastor Brian was huge yeah, and especially for someone that mm. was, you know, very green on the trail and I always appreciated him for that. But at the end of it, he said, he said, oh, I appreciate you you showing me this. It sounds very exciting, but mm. um, we're a church, not a, not a film studio. And then he said, you know, one thing my dad always told me was that when there's more than one vision, it creates division. Mm. And that was a real kind of fork in the road for me because in my heart, my dreams and desires was to, to direct film. Yeah. And at the time, my senior pastor, who I love and the church that I love and wanted to be part of building is mm. basically saying, bum, bum, we're not, we're not going to do that. We're yeah. just going to church. I felt like God said you had to die to that dream mm. and serve the vision. Fast forward, years go on and on and on and on. And then I've been, you know, on staff 10 years now and three years ago, so seven years into that journey, TBN called, Matt Crouch called and asked Brian if he would ever consider having a channel. And that, I mean, Brian tells the story where he almost fell off his chair, but, mm. you know, the, the lead up to that, that seven years was preparing us for something more. And there was an itch, you know, over that time for more. Mm. We knew that there, but just we didn't know what it was. There was no clarity to yeah. it. So, yeah, from a, from a team of eight, ten years ago, um, creatives working on weekend-to-weekend type things and conferences to now staff of close to 80 people around the world mm. um, and we're fulfilling the needs of a 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week channel, mm. Christian channel. So... Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> it's a big learning curve, yeah. but but that ten year period, you know, and mm. there's a lot of there's a lot of dreaming, and you talk about in the early days of of dreaming. Mm. And I think dreams are important. I think for me, where I what I struggled with was trying to force that dream into reality well before its time, right. and understanding that the journey of waiting on God isn't just because. He's watching the clock, hoping for a better time. Mm. It's the work internally. You know, mm. when this channel came about, yes, it was a stretch. Yes, we're out of our depth, but we were so much more prepared that if it came two years in, right. you know, to mm. to running the team. And so, um, yes, today looks very, very different mm. to where it was. Um, but, you know, we have a lot of fun doing it. Yeah. <laughs> but I just love the landscape shift, like I was saying before, you know, mm. God, the faithfulness of, of him is that running a TV, Christian television network was not my dream. Right. Still isn't. Mm-hmm. But it's one step closer to satisfying mm-hmm. that, you know, and when we see, and I'm all on board, you know, like love what we're doing, but it's it's achieving the same goal, which is that people are on the other end will come to know Christ in a way that maybe they might not have the opportunity mm, to. Mm. And it's and it's witnessing the transformation in people's lives that go, ah, oh, that's the quencher. Right. You know? um, and for us today, that's the cross film, television, digital media, mm. however else we can do it. Yeah. We'll get right back to the episode, brought to you by our Hillsong Worship and Creative Conference, which happens in Sydney, Australia. It's for every kind of creative, whether you're a musician, singer, a graphic designer, architect, an audio engineer, or video editor. It's a place for the artists of the church to gather together, to worship, to be inspired and refreshed, and to be equipped and trained for your sphere of creativity. Come be a part of everything happening on site, like the exclusive collabs with practical training from our key Hillsong team. The conference has limited spaces, so if you can't make it to Sydney this year, why not join the online conference experience so you don't miss a moment of the main sessions? Find out more details at hillsong.com forward slash WCC. Now, let's get back to the episode. Hi, I'm Benfield, and this is my Fantastic Four. My favourite cuisine would be steak, potatoes, broccoli. I'm a meat and two veg kind of guy. Latest book that I've read is one called Leading on Empty, which is about leading when your tank is empty. That was very helpful because I was empty. My favourite fail moment would be splitting my pants 
uh, in at work when a friend of mine dared me to pretend to be sniped as if I was being shot, um, like you see in the uh, Call of Duty games, and I crouched and fell under the ground and then I realised I'd split my pants, but it was too early in the morning to fix and I had to go the whole workday with split pants. My favourite movie this year would be A Star Is Born, uh, the remake with Bradley Cooper and Lady Gaga. Um, I thought it was incredible, incredible story. And then I, I may or may not have cried several times throughout it, <laughs> which is, um, that to me is a gauge of a good story when you can connect with it emotionally like that. So, um, You mentioned having one one vision mm -hmm. and, and if we have multiple visions that can create division. division. Yeah. Um, Pastor Brian wrote The Church I Now See, which is our church's vision yeah. statement. You know it well, but for those listening, it says, well, a section of it says this. It says, I see a church that is constantly innovative, a church that leads the communication of a timeless message through media, film, and technology, a church with a message beamed to its people around the globe through their television screens, bringing Jesus into homes, palaces, and prisons alike. Yeah. Um, obviously with the Hillsong Channel, that's when Pastor Brian wrote that, he he didn't know about the channel. The channel didn't and, exist. And, yeah. um, no, it didn't exist. And now it does. And so I guess we're starting to, to outwork some of that yeah. vision. But I wondered from your perspective where the future lies. You know, mm. what, what are the untapped, um, what's the untapped potential mm. um, for the church when it comes to media and TV yeah. and, and film? Yeah. You know, you're obviously in amongst it. Right. What are we not doing, not just Hillsong Church, but the church? Yeah. Well, I think with every new endeavour, you you tend to look around at what has been done and then you either try and imitate it until you figure out what is your lane or how to change it if that's what's needed. Mm. Um, what excites me about the church being active in media as opposed to a media agency doing Christian stuff is the lifeblood of Christ that runs through the church. It literally is the 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 veins mm. that is that is hard. Christ is mm. building his church and yeah. that's what's attached to it. Um and that to me, you know, there's plenty of, you know, when times get tied and or you, people get off as people say, oh, why don't you go out and do it on your own? Or mm. why don't you go and the thing that I keep coming back to is I'm called to build a church. Yeah. Or actually like Christ is about the church. It's his bride. And there's a life and energy to that that you can't get by building a company with the same agenda of making right. those shows. Mm -hmm. And so what's exciting for the church is I think bringing what we do as church to the world, and I don't mean church services or, you know, music. I think it's it's what we experience as the body of Christ, mm. which is it's living in the fullness of who he is. Um, it's it's seeing community gathered together in worship. It's it's allowing um, you know, environments where healings can take places and, and miracles can happen. Mm. Um, funnily enough, like last night at team night, and it was an incredible night, but what stood out to me was just in the worship, either either side of Gabe talking. Mm. Felt like God just say, I want to heal people. And it was in context to last night, yes. but it was also in context to what I have in my hand. Mm. And it started me thinking, okay, we can create entertainment for Christians, mm. but it's an oversaturated, entertainment's such an oversaturated market. Yeah. And Christians can't make the highest rating stuff. It's just, there's no model for it at the moment because right. of financial and distribution. Mm. We should always achieve an excellence, but what do we have that other storytellers don't have? Yeah, we have we have the kingdom, right? We have mm. we have salvation. We have the salvation message, mm. and that transcends anything. That's heart transformation. That is the goal of what yeah. we're about. Mm. And so it gets me thinking, and gets I get really fired up about it. It's like, okay, well, what does it look like to? create content that allows people to be ministered to. Yeah. Not just to observe a conversation about God and how great he is, mm. but where they can tune in and feel the presence of God in their lounge room. Mm. That's what excites me about what we can do as the church is mm. bring the presence, usher the presence of God in through the airwaves. Mm. And I was just saying to our team this morning in team meeting, we have such an advantage we're invited into people's homes. Right. We're invited onto their mobile devices and their tablets. Mm. Some, a lot of people don't darken the door of a church every Sunday. Mm. They might not even come at all. They may not know God. Mm. But we have this incredible 
incredible privilege through media to come straight into the centre of their lives. Yeah. And we can't take that for granted as the church. Mm. That's an incredible opportunity. We don't want to be brash with it. We don't want to be coming in and hitting people over the head too hard. Mm. But we do want to bring what is the core message of who he is. Mm. And so, you know, when we get letters of people who have literally been healed mm. off programs that I would never imagine that had the potential of doing it, but yeah. God used it. Yeah. Um, we can never underestimate what God can use those, you mm. know, use those programs. Yeah, with. So right. that excites me and excites me about creativity within the church. I mean, the church is in terms of creativity, like, you know, more now than ever we're, we're at the height, well, not the height, but we're we're emerging mm. in creativity. Um, the accessibility to creative tools now to yeah. be able to create is sure. um, is more accessible these mm. days, and um, be able to get the messages out is um, so much more available now, thanks mm. to the internet and so on and so forth. So, what aren't we doing? I don't know. I I kind of haven't really had time to focus on what we're not doing well at. <laughs> right. I think because of what we are doing, just, just so time consuming. Yeah. But um, I think we're doing well. I think the church as a whole, capital C church, I think I think if we can just keep awakening people to what God is doing, yeah. I think we what we do well at is talking ab- about God. What we could do better at is helping people connect with Him. Mm-hmm. I love teaching messages, watching that, but... What if we took it a step further and just made sure that people connected with him, you know? Right. And so that I would love to see that, you know, more in our programming. And that's mm. definitely the vision for it is how do we become more of a hospital than mm-hmm. an entertainment platform mm. and see the needs of people met rather than just give them something to watch? Yeah. There's a tension there between, say, you could just get a camera, read the scripture and it being quite dry right. and not entertaining mm-hmm. versus um, the other way where the message is diluted so much by the fact right. that you're trying to be entertaining. Right. And there's a real balance in there mm-hmm. of sort yeah. of doing both, I yeah. imagine. Yeah, there is. And you have to because, you know, the the creativity around creating programming is the shop front window, you mm-hmm. know, when you're shopping, you know, you see the shop front window, um, what attracts you in is what, you know, they're, they're – their biggest products on, you know, on display and you think that looks cool, I'll I'll come in. Mm. And that's what creativity does. It wraps around that message in a way that creates it to be inviting Mm. um, to come in. But, yeah, that I think that's the tension that Christian media has always faced Mm. is people who have the message and want the message to go out but don't have the creative chops to package it in a way that's Mm. going to be palatable for Mm. people. Or you have the opposite end where you have a lot of creatives and the message is so diluted that you wonder whether it has any effect at all. Yeah. Finding the best of both is is really kind of the the silver lining. If you mm. can do that, and then you've created something great. Yeah. But I'm just I'm always conscious. God is on the move. Time is short. Yeah. There's an urgency to what we have, mm. and that's a daily thing to go. Okay, what do I have in my hand? What is what has God entrusted me with? Am I using it to the best of my? Am I is my ear is my ear open to the Holy Spirit? Because mm. there's a lot of ideas I have which the flesh goes, oh, that's kind of nerdy, and then I'm like, <laughs> well, hang on a sec, this is has the potential for the power of God to move through it. Right. How do we create it in a way that's palatable mm. but still maintains? the strength for God to be able to use it in a powerful way. Yeah. That's con- that thinking's constantly changed. When the channel first came, I was all about making it look good, the brand feel good, you mm. know, having high rating programs mm. um, that would range from faith heavy to faith light. As time goes on, God just keeps reminding me time short. Mm giving the church the channel for a reason is because mm. I want to connect with people. I want mm. them to know who I am. I yeah. want them to understand the full power of what I have uh, for them in their life. Mm. So get about it. Yeah. And then suddenly you start looking at the programs you create and you go, do we need to dial that in a bit more? Mm. You know, is that just mm. too light? Yeah. But television's a funny thing because it's like a buffet, right? It's <laughs> People want different programming at different times. We mm. do it when we flick through Netflix. Right. You know, I like watching documentaries, but sometimes you just want to watch a comedy. Right. And so you have to have light and shade, you know, and cross when you're putting together a whole uh, fleet of programming. Mm. But I, I do, the tension is always there is like, how light is too light? Mm. How's the heavy stuff? How do we not fall into the trap of 
making it feel a certain way that kind of alienates people away yes. from the message. Yeah, yeah. And that'll always be a tension, I think. Right. So then obviously not every church, local church, is going to have a, a channel a right. broadcast 24-7. Yeah. Um, but there are other tools oh, yeah. uh, online now, YouTube, the like. Um, yeah. There's, there's sort of ways that people can still get the message out yeah. there. So from that perspective, what would you say, just real practically, to the young person in their creative team somewhere, you know, around the world, um, what would you say to them about, I guess, advice on they've got big dreams, yeah, but they've got to start somewhere. Yeah. What, what would you say if you were doing that, what would you do? Yeah, well, I always like working backwards from the big dream. You know, what is step, if the dream is step 10, mm. What's step one that's going to help you get there? And start with what you do have in your hand. I think that's one thing that, you know, in all my years I've learned most of the, the power of what's in your hand is the power. Don't look at the lack. Yeah. Look at what you do have. Mm. And that's always there's always an advantage to that. Mm. And then just do what's on your heart. I think that the best compass or the best metric we have is what God tells you to do. Don't overthink it. Don't try and be too clever. Don't try and be over creative just for creative sake. Mm. What's your message? Stick to that message. Do the best you can. And if you have to bump out 10 things that are mediocre just to get to a great one, that's okay too. Right. And I think a lot of people stumble on my my first one has to be everything that's mm-hmm. me. I have to wrap everything that I am and all my years has to be put right. in this one thing. Mm. And sometimes God will use the small piece that's mediocre and mm. And work through that in powerful ways. So never underestimate what God can do with the little that you have. Mm. But you don't need a channel. The channel sometimes can be a thorn in the side. It's not often an open door of opportunity because mm. now you have a responsibility to fill so much airtime. Right. So filling so much airtime, you get busy. It takes a lot of work, takes a lot of managing of people, takes a lot of ideas, takes a lot of things that mm. can distract, you mm-hmm. know. Currently now... I'm more in the position where I'm longing for what I used to have, those quiet times in in the wilderness with him to be Mm. able to hear from him more intimately Mm. because although we've grown and on the outwards are like, wow, it's amazing, you've got a channel and you're reaching Mm. all these people. It's like, yeah, but my my head's so cluttered now, Mm. I don't even know, am I hearing God anymore? Because I'm just so busy on Mm. making this thing happen. Mm. And I think that can be a distraction. Mm. And so, you know, I I reach a point in my life now (laughs) where – that's challenging for me, mm. you know, and what is the answer to that? Do you tap out? And you go, you can't tap out. Mm. It's rolling, God's moving. And right. you go, yeah, it is, but is it distracting me from what he's actually asked me to do? Right. And I think you reach that at all different milestones in life mm. where you have to reassess, mm. understand what has he called you to do? What Have you been distracted? You know, is the opportunity is given you, are you maximising that? Yeah. Are you listening to his voice? And so, yes, you may not have a channel, but... You do have YouTube, you do have a camera, you do have a message. Mm. Think about how to communicate to the people you're trying to communicate to. Mm. You don't have to make a movie to reach people in your street. You right. know, you just need to create something that speaks to them. Mm. I think sometimes we think too high concept, mm-hmm. like we're trying to impress people with our message of, right. of God. God is love. People are searching for love. It's one of the mm. highest things that people are needing. If you want to grab people around your watering hole conversation, mm. talk about love. Mm. Talk about the, the simple things that we take for granted right. that people are longing for mm. before you get into the big conversations of, right. of God that are just going to lose people who mm. are searching mm. for him. So I think sometimes simple is better. Use what you have that's in your hand. Um, And don't underestimate what God's put in your spirit to do. Mm. And a lot of people around you might say, oh, it's kind of corny. You know what? Give it a shot. Mm. If you think it's corny when you're done with it, then don't put it out. Or do put it out Mm. under a different name and then see how it goes, (laughs) you know. But but that's the thing is like God will always be telling you things that are contradictory to what may be cultural norms at the Mm. time. Mm. Anyone can emulate what's going on and what's hot and what's popular. The advantage we have as believers is that God knows what's ahead of the curve Mm. um, and no data can match what he knows. Mm. And so don't rely on trends, rely Mm. on him Mm. um, and trust him that he knows it's in the future and he'll be faithful to it. Mm. So it's a a walking on water scenario always, Mm. but I feel like that's where true creativity can come from. Yeah. I love that. Hey, well, Ben Field, it's been great having you on the Hillsong Creative Podcast. Yes, thank you. I feel like you've um, 
You've shared your heart. You've shared real wisdom for for listeners, for filmmakers, and just Christians and creatives in general. So thank you. I really appreciate it. You're welcome. Hey, well, I hope you found that inspiring and encouraging and that there's something in there that you can apply to your own creativity. In episode 36, we interviewed Solomon Letham, who's another well-known filmmaker who was part of our team and a great friend of ours. And I'd highly encourage you to go listen to that one if you haven't already. And if you're in the video world, you're a filmmaker, an editor, a storyteller, and you'd like to find out more about the way we approach it and Ben's whole team, Ben also runs the Hillsong Film and TV podcast, which I'm sure you'll find encouraging and a great resource for your endeavours. Just search Hillsong Film and TV wherever you get your podcast from. At the end of our time with Ben, I actually took some time to ask him some questions that you guys as listeners had sent in to us. He was good enough to answer all of those, and we're going to include those in a future episode. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on that and all the stuff that's coming up. That's it for today's episode. I hope you've enjoyed it and it's been useful for your journey. And I always love to hear from you. So please write us a review on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. It helps with the visibility of the podcast and it lets us know what you think, what you're enjoying and where we can go with the podcast in the future. Aside from that, you can write to me on Twitter or Instagram at Rich Langton and we'll talk to you next time.